So um, yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about the emergence and the syntax of Sika in Catalan and Sika does amongst other things um, express positive polarity, speak a commitment towards the truth uh, value of a proposition. So we will see that um, it is actually quite an interesting combination of two words, or I will try to convince you of that. So um, the roadmap for today is the following. We will first look at how Sika works in modern Catalan. Then we will focus on C, um, the, the first element of this cluster and look how we get it from Latin um, until, um, like how we get it from Latin and how it evolves um, to Old Catalan. And then we will look at how this Old Catalan C um, changes and um, kind of undergoes uh, certain transformations <laughs> to get to the current modern Catalan seeker. And in the end, I will draw some conclusions from the data and the analysis that I will have presented. And, um, and I will point at some questions that remain to be answered. And uh, finally, I will be very happy to get your comments and, and your questions and try to answer them. So let's look at Sika in modern Catalan. We will look at its uses at its syntactic dis distribution, and then we will look a bit at the underlying syntactic structure and the analysis that have been proposed for this sort of structure across the Romance languages and whether they are applicable or not to, to the Catalan data. So first of all, Sika in modern Catalan has three main uses. It can be used to answer positively, affirmatively to yes, no questions. It can be used to express agreement with a previous statement and it can be used to correct a previous statement. So to reverse the polarity of a previous st statement. That makes modern cats and seeker quite parallel, quite parallel to the Italian seeker, but quite different from Spanish seeker. Spanish seeker being used explicitly to express speaker commitment towards the truth of the proposition contained in the clause where the seeker cluster appears. Um, so when we talk about speaker commitment, um, we talk about epistemic modality, right? So epistemic value of seek or the, the, the epistemic uh, semantics of it. When I use these labels, I refer to the degree of speaker commitment to the truth value of the proposition contained in, in the clause that is, is uh, introduced by the cluster. And this is along the lines of, um, of the way in which other authors have used um, the, the label epistemic as well in recent literature. So let's have a look now at some examples of how Sika may be used as a positive answer to yes, no questions. Do you like apples? There are different ways to answer that you do like apples. One of them is simply to use C as an affirmative um, particle. Uh, we can use C with content of the, um, of the clause that I'm assuming is being um, elided as we will see later on, or we can simply use Sika as we can see in B3. Seeker can have an emphatic or a neutral reading, um, but that would be at prosodic, at prosodic level. We don't see it um, when we write it down. There is no, no other thing that could indicate apart from prosody that is being used emphatically. It can be used as an expression of agreement with a previous statement. Um, here the statement would be, you do like apples, and you know we can answer exactly in the same way as we answered to yes, no question questions and we can use seeker in an emphatic or a non-emphatic way and we can use it to correct a previous statement you don't like apples los pomas no te agradan and what are you going on about i do like apples i eat one every day um, in this case we would use it emphatically and reverse the polarity of the previous statement that is being corrected by using seeker and in this case we could not use the other alternatives that we have seen um, in the other cases now, I have identified 10 syntactic features um, that will help us describe the syntax and locate Sika within the left periphery, which are listed here, and we will now have a look at them quite swiftly. So Sika cannot occur in out of the blue contexts, and the clause in which it is contained, it can, cannot contain material that has not been introduced previously in the common ground. So something like four would be impossible. Capacet, that is absolutely out, you know, what's going on? We will indeed go to the party. Sounds weird in English too. Sika cannot be split. So nothing can intervene between C and K. Things can precede the cluster and things can follow the, the cluster, but they cannot 
appear in between. And it cannot be modified or negated. So C cannot receive modification of any kind and cannot be negated, as we can see. Seeker can be preceded and followed by topics and scene setters, as we can see in nine and in 10, where we have about this topics with different syntactic realization. So in nine, a critical left is located topic in 10, a hanging topic that can happily precede seeker. And um, scene setters can, can uh, occur after it as well. Uh, we could also have it preceding it, as we can see in this example extracted from the internet. It can be followed, but not preceded by foci. And that's something that, uh, that will be relevant when locating it in the left periphery. And in this case, we have the, the focal particle numes occurring after seeker quite happily. Seeker numes es por conveni, that's absolutely fine. But we could not have anything containing this numes for focal particle preceding seeker. Seeker can be preceded and followed by adverb plus complementizer clusters or structures. And here I'm using Cocher 2017's terminology to refer to clusters that are formed um, by something that looks like an adverb and that is always adjacent to ke and, um, and that heads and, and that is the head of, of, a, of a clause um, that follows. Um, they tend to have in modern Catalan an epistemic or evidential value. And they can proceed or follow seeker, depending on whether they are epistemic or evidential. There are some constraints to, to their distribution um, amongst themselves if they co occur in the same clause. But we're not going to address this now. If you want to talk about it later in, in common time, uh, I am very happy to, to, to talk about this. But as you can see, a bit in men que si que perdut libertats, that's absolutely fine. A get cop si que segur que era la cadena ser. That's absolutely fine too. So we can have them proceeding or following Sika. And that will be again relevant to see what, what the underlying structure of this little cluster is. Um, the K clause can contain negation and negative polarity items, even though C is a positive polarity item, as we can see in these two examples. And seeker can occur in embedded clauses, be them relative clauses, as is the case of 18, this example where we have the antecedent alguna cosa and then the relative clause que seeker o fasi, uh, happily modifying it containing seeker. And uh, it can occur in complement clauses, as we see here with the verb to feel. Que sento que si, que es valora la meva música, I feel that indeed my music is, is, is valued as it should. Um, phrases, elements can move across the seeker cluster, as we can see here in 20, within the embedded clause. And um, this actually tells us about the nature of ke, uh, because in the Romance languages we have different types of ke depending on where they are located in the left periphery. We have high ke, which is located in force, and we have lower instances of ke linked to uh, juicy verbative values that are located in lower projections, um, such as pimpi, for instance. Uh, when we have instances of high ke, basically uh, they allow for extraction across them, but they also allow for uh, bound variable reconstruction, and and Sika happily allows that. So that tells us that the ke we're dealing with is a high ke, which would be akin to the ke that we find in complement clauses. Um, when we have a lower ke, like here, um, in which, like example 22, in which we have a juicive ke, um, basically um, bound variable reconstruction is out. And finally, C in seeker can act as a positive sentential perform, as we saw in the first example, where we saw that it could happily uh, answer affirmatively to a yes no question. And I'm assuming that an affirm that, um, that a positive sentential perform. Uh, would have the structure um, um, that is shown in 23 and that is adapted from Holmberg's work on sentential problems, positive and negative. Now, these syntactic features that I have just described for Sika are actually shared with adverb plus complementizer structures that, as I said before, can be in, in Katzen epistemic or evidential. And this is something that will be relevant when we look at the diachronic evolution of, of Sika. Now, several analyses have been proposed for seeker across the Romance languages. 
Um, I will sketch them now and, and draw the main points why they may or may not be relevant for the modern Catalan data. So we have pollutants and opportunities analysis for Sica in Italian, uh, which basically assumes a biclosal structure where, where we have a higher clause that contains a null copy of the proposition contained, of the sentence contained in the clause, and that contains the uh, polarity element, be it C or null in, in its negative counterpart. And this polarity element, um, um, is bound to a null operator that uh, links it to the lower clause that is headed by Qua. And the main issue with this analysis is that this null copy of the sentence that is found in the higher clause is located in the speech act phrase or, a, or the frame field, depending on which uh, author, which terminology we follow. And that precludes uh, CK sentences in Italian from being embedded, but we saw that in Catalan they can happily be embedded. And that would also preclude the fact that we have C bound to uh, the polarity of the lower clause would also preclude uh, the possibility of having sentence like seek or not, which we saw in Catalan like possible. So this analysis does not necessarily explain the Catalan data. Then we have analysis for adverb plus complementizer clusters that in Catalan at least pattern with Sika that have been put forth for Italo Romans and Romanian that assume a monoclosal uh, structure where we would have the adverbial ish particle um, in the speech act phrase above force B, and we would have K indeed being a high K being realized in force B. However, this um, having the adverbial like element in the speech act layer would mean that the sentence cannot be embedded and it would preclude the possibility of seeker being followed by other adverb plus complementizer clauses. Because if all adverb plus complementizer clauses have a speech act layer where the adverb appears, then we cannot have this following clause, right? Um, yes, another analysis proposed for adverb plus complementizer clauses, in this case for Old Spanish, is that of Cochar 2017. Um, this author basically uh, locates the adverb particle in modifier phrase within the left periphery, which would explain why uh, the cluster can be preceded by hanging topics and other types of topical stuff, but not focus not, not necessarily. And uh, she locates the k in the low left periphery in fin p and, um, and makes it move to the head of mod p. Um, now, this is problematic for Catalan because as we saw in Catalan, we have a high, a high K. We have a fully fetched left periphery following it that can host foci and topics and even uh, scene setting things. And, um, and uh, therefore cannot be applied to the modern Catalan data. So this brought me to, uh, to propose uh, another analysis of this structure in modern Catalan which is basically by clausal in the spirit of Poletons and Antinis 2013. Um, and this uh, explains why, why we have two fully fledged left peripheries and why mostly everything that can precede the cluster can also follow the cluster. Um, it locates C in this modifier phrase that here I, I describe as slash polarity phrase. I, I will go on to that in just a second. And it may or may not see base generated in this phrase within the left periphery undergo movement to FOC P to receive emphasis. As we saw, it can be emphatic in modern Catalan. Then it assumes the existence of a null truth predicate, and that would be following um, um, Kruskin and Lindbergh's 2017's analysis of this type of structure in, in, in Italian romance. And diachronically, this is backed up, as we will see in just a moment. Now, this polarity head that I'm assuming exists in the left periphery uh, um, would host relative polarity features. 
And relative polarity features would be different from absolute polarity features. And this is shown in 28. Relative polarity features would express agreement or disagreement in relation to the previous discourse, to the common ground, as described by Bruce and Farkas in 2010. And absolute polarity features uh, would basically just um, would basically just be whether uh, a predicate is positive or negative and would be the projection in which we would find no in romance or have nothing when uh, we, we have uh, an affirmative sentence. This is explored um, at length in Martin's 2013. Now, how do we get this C um, related to polarity in Catalan? Well, in Latin we have the, the manner adverb sic that is used in, in answers to yes, no questions in an emphatic way, as we can see in example 29. And this manner uh, adverb sic surfaces in different ways in the medieval romance languages. In the Gallo-Romance and Italo-Romance varieties, it has been linked to the fulfillment of the V2 parameter. And in Iberian romance, it has mainly been linked to the expression of emphatic positive polarity. So how do we get sic, a manner adverb, convey emphatic positive polarity in, in Old Catalan? Well, we get seek um, conveying emphatic positive polarity through a process of grammaticalization in a specific context. But seek also yields a manner adverb, a she, and it also ends up um, yielding um, a consecutive subordinator seeker that is homophonous with, uh, with the expression that we're talking about today. So how do we get the emphatic positive polarity particle from the um, from the uh, manner adverb. Well, we do so through a process of grammaticalization um, within the scope of non veridical operators. Mainly, it starts appearing um, as emphatically in the answers of yes, no question that can act as a non veridical operator, and then it extends the contexts in which it can appear. Um, but it's always within a non within the scope of a non veridical operator that we find this particle in Catalan, in Old Catalan. Um, and non veridical operators are the context where we find positive polarity items. So it's very normal that it has this sort of semantics. Here we have an example. We have a non veridical um, context, which would be the protesis, si homes del món and mala fama. So if there are men in the world that have bad reputation, even if some people in the world have bad reputation, this elicits a reading that, okay, people have bad reputation, so you, person saying this sentence, have you must have bad reputation too. And to cancel out that possible reading, the speaker uses C um, emphatically in order to say that something, that, that it is indeed the case that they have good reputation, even if other people have bad reputation. If you want to know more about this and properly have a, a better explanation than the one I've just delivered, you can you can read um, Pujolic and Payne 2019. So how do we go from having this emphatic positive polarity particle to having the, the modern Catalan seeker? Because this emphatic positive polarity particle is verb adjacent, can be preceded by material, but overall has a distribution that is different from the seeker that we find in modern Catalan. Well, we don't get seeker until the second half of the 16th century, whereas we get the emphatic positive polarity particle already by the end of the 12th, 13th century. Um, however, in the second half of the 16th century, they coexist, as we can see in 31. So in, in, in 31, we have uh, a conversation between Don Pedro and Livio. And um, in Don Pedro's intervention, actually, we have the emphatic positive polarity particle use of C, Whereas in Livius' intervention, in order to uh, reverse the polarity of something that Don Pedro has uh, implied, Sica is used. Several factors contribute to the emergence of Sica, among which the decline of the consecutive subordinator that was mentioned before and that is homophonous with it, with Sica, the decline of the use of the emphatic positive polarity particle, and the consolidated use of C as a sentential perform. And as well as a consolidated adverb plus complementizer, complementizer paradigm. So we saw that in modern Catalan we have evidential and epistemic adverbs that occur with 
forming like little little bundles, so to speak. Um, and that paradigm is consolidated by the time that seeker emerges. Um, the consecutive subordinator actually has semantics that are quite distinct from the ones of seeker, so it's actually quite easy to tell them apart in the in the medieval written record, and it it means uh, in such a way that as a result it has it has really a consecutive uh, like consecutive semantics as we saw the positive polarity particle use of c um is within the scope of non-veridical operators but has a, a, a specific distribution of its own and it has to be verb adjacent the verb can be alive like in this example but it can also be present as, as we saw before and and um so we 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 know this use of C. And then I said that the consolidation by the second half of the 16th century of the adverb plus complementizer paradigm actually played quite a, a role in the emergence of Sika, because what I will argue is that Sika actually integrates this paradigm that emerges in the 14th century. And this is why it has exactly the same syntactic distribution and properties as adverb plus complementizer clusters in modern Catalan. So the adverb plus complementizer Catalan uh, plus complementizer cluster in Catalan emerges, um, um, I think, from uh, copular constructions with an overt experience remarked in the dative that were used to express um, epistemic modality, that someone was certain about something. And here we have the skeleton of this structure. Structures in Old Catalan in which the experiencer was marked in the dative decline from the 15th century. And we have uh, the paradigm emerging in the 14th century, um, competing with these structures to express emphatic positive polarity. In addition uh, to occurring in, in these structures, the adjectives that are used here, which are set and seru, certain and safe, um, were also used as adverbs uh, with um, verbs of knowing and speaking and saying, as we can see here in 36. So I know certain, I know for sure, it is used as an adverb that um, in Pujoli campaign 2021, 20, you, can, you can see how this is certainly an adverb by this point and not an adjective. Now, I also said that the consolidated use of C as a sentential proof played a role in the emergence of Sika. And that is because in Old Catalan, we actually had two sentential performs to answer yes, no questions, C and Hoc from the 13th century. And from the second half of the 15th century, there is a reversal in the frequency of use of Hoc and C starts being favored. Um, to answer yes, no questions, apart from being able to use C or Hoc, the the adverbs that we find in adverb plus complementizer clusters could also be used like cert and so so we could say that c being used in a similar way to answer yes no questions might actually be a way to make it parallel to those things that are also used to answer yes no questions but also act as adverb plus complementizer elements here is a sketch of the grammaticalization process that I, I propose for the adverb plus complementizer clusters. Uh, the take home message, however, I could walk you through this, but we don't have the time. The take home message, however, if, if we use, if we look at stage five, is that I propose that, um, that we end up having a silent uh, predicate that um, a silent, uh, a silent uh, predicate that aligns this analysis with uh, Kruskin and Rimberger's analysis of um, adverb plus complementizer structures in Italian romance, where we have this truth predicate that is modified by the adverb, and that takes the and that takes the sentence headed by k as its complement, and this would explain the adjacency between the adverb and the k and the impossibility of introducing material between them, and would also explain, um, um, well, would help explain the semantics of the, of the structure. Um, bearing in mind that I propose that it comes from a copular construction that expresses epistemic uh, commitment of the speaker, um, it's a bit more complex how I think we get there, but, um, but I think it's very much in line 
with uh, what Chris Kinn and Lindberg, and Lindberger propose. Now let's look a bit at the big picture of how all these little factors interact into bringing about Zika. So here we see that adverb plus complementarizer structures emerge in the old Catalan record, uh, written record in the second half of the 14th century. And they consolidate, they are consolidated by the first half of the 17th and they survive until modern Catalan quite happily, quite happily. Seek doesn't emerge until the second half of the 16th century, but we know that is then attested until the modern day when it is pervasively used. And actually we see that uh, C, emphatic positive polarity particle, and C, uh, the adverbial one that meant as a result or in such a way that declined sharply in their use just before C, uh, um, epistemic modality, positive polarity, emerges in the second half of the 16th century. So the fact that we lose possible contexts in which there would have been ambiguity as to how C was uh, used, um, so we lose those, and we have the consolidation of the adverb plus complementizer uh, structure with adverbs joining in, um, like Sogudamin, makes it possible for C that is in this um, positive polarity category that appears in non veridical contexts to join the paradigm. So, to wrap up, I propose that Sika presents a biclosal structure with a silent truth predicate um, that would be the source structure of the adverb plus complementizer uh, constructions in, in Old Katzen and that would end up being uh, silenced and, and yielding the, the seemingly adverb plus complementizer structures that we see. And that Sika is actually the result of several factors, um, is a result of C, having been grammaticalized as an emphatic positive polarity particle of the emergence of the adverb plus complementizer structure of the these appearance of the homophonous adverbial subordinator seeker of the rise of C as a positive sentential perform making C pattern even more with the adverb plus complementizer elements. I have talked about the existence of a projection within the left that might be this Martin's 2013 Paul P or Ridge's uh, 2004 modifier phrase that may actually host um, relative polarity features or features that link the sentence with the discourse. But there remain, um, but it remains to be to be explored how this phrase uh, would be connected to the speech act phrase or layer that is located above force P. And um, there, is, there are two things that are yet to be determined. That is how C plus verb is lost in modern Catalan. It is, sorry, in modern Catalan, in Catalan. It is preserved in Spanish, but in Catalan it is lost. And now we only have Sika. And how the adverbial Sika actually is lost too. And um, this is it from me. I will be very happy to answer questions and to get any comments that, uh, that you may have. Thank you so much.